science. An exciting world of research, imagination, and the willingness to question everything. Join us on a strange journey as five unlikely experiments come together into one astounding discovery, changing our lives forever. Open a door in your mind and step through into the realm of weird connections. In this episode, your brain on placebo power. It's a mysterious force deep inside all of us that can actually make physical changes in our body and brain without drugs, surgery, or anything more than a strong suggestion. Find out how to access this force in five weird connections. At first, this scene makes no sense. A college professor is apparently trying to get his students drunk. This is yours, Joyce. Yours free, by the way. <laughs> so help yourself. Even worse, the bar is on campus in the University of Washington's Addictive Research Center. Are you for real? Who is serving the drinks? The center's director, Alan Marlett, a behavioral psychologist. It's a little awkward. <laughs> <laughs> we built this uh, because we wanted to look at actual student drinking behavior in a bar setting. If you have people drink in laboratory rooms, you know, they don't drink very much. As you may have guessed, this is actually an experiment. Dr. Marlett wants to stop the perils of drinking by studying its pleasures. His message could not be more serious. Students consume dangerous levels of alcohol because they believe that's the only way to feel its desired effects. Nationally, this is a significant problem. We see um, about half of the college students uh, experiencing at least one episode of binge drinking in the last uh, month. So we're really concerned about accidents and memory problems and sexual problems and you name it. He believes the most powerful ingredient in beer is not really alcohol. It's the human mind. That is, your expectation that you will feel drunk. We're looking at uh, factors that might increase the risk of excessive drinking. So we're trying to figure out, is it the alcohol that does this? Or is it, to some extent, what you expect is going to happen when you drink? Twelve students were simply told they'd be participating in a study about social interactions among strangers. The setting? A bar with unlimited free beer. Watch carefully. This certainly looks like college students beginning to feel tipsy on beer. They started out as strangers in awkward small talk. Okay, let's go back to the table and say our names. What's your favorite movie? What sign are you? But as the experiment continued, the students began to display the classic signs of drunkenness. Flushed faces, slurred speech, and bad jokes. Why was this respected professor offering his students alcohol? We're going to reveal the truth here. <laughs> Not everybody got alcohol. Turns out, he wasn't. Some of you did and some of you didn't. Only three of the 12 were actually drinking alcohol. The rest had non-alcoholic beer. That's really funny. <laughs> I think that is, I think that's like the best experiment after my life. <laughs> I face me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of my friends will die. <laughs> yes, I'll be careful the next time a strange man gives me a drink. <laughs> Actually, their symptoms of drunkenness were quite real. But they weren't caused by alcohol. It was something far more mysterious. The placebo effect. You know, whenever you drink, there's three things going on. You know, the beverage that you're drinking, secondly, the setting that you're in, the context, other people that are there, and third, the set that you're expecting you about your own personal expectations about how alcohol, how alcohol is going to affect you, your mood or your behavior. A lot of it is what we call classical conditioning. Remember Pavlov's dog? You ring the bell. If it's associated with food in the past, the dog starts to salivate. So that's a kind of a placebo kinds of things. That kind of conditioned response can also work in people. So if people are given a drink, here's a drink, and you're in a bar setting, you get similar effects to Pavlov's dogs. 
your body starts to react as if it's having real alcohol. It can also work in the field of medicine. There are cases where patients have an amazing response to a sugar pill. If you're going to a doctor and the doctor says, you have this particular physical condition, and we're giving you a pill that should alleviate the physical symptoms that you're experiencing, often there will be lower physical symptoms because the doctor told you that's what's going to happen. Dr. Marlett was hoping for a similar therapeutic effect in its students. So we think that what we're doing is kind of getting at people's psychological dependencies about alcohol, because if they're getting the same effects without any real alcohol, they probably are coming to realize they don't need to drink as much to get the same effects. The power of the placebo has had a profound effect on the lives of the students who participated in his study. People that are thinking, I must have alcohol to get these effects, no, you can get the effects without alcohol. So what that does is, uh, in our research, tends to lower people's drinking subsequently. Now we'll see how the same placebo effect can help alleviate pain. You are looking at one of the bravest graduate students ever. Either Kate is selflessly devoted to science, or she desperately needs an A. She volunteered to be burned without a painkiller. What we're going to do now is test your pain sensitivity on different parts of the skin. Her professor, Tor Wager, a Columbia University psychologist, is placing a metal plate heated to 110 degrees on her forearm. So here's the first one. It hurts. <laughs> it's, I, I think it's, uh, it's like holding a hot cup of coffee. Ow. It's a very hot cup of coffee that you want to let go of, but you can't put it down just yet. Uh. It's a very uncomfortable experiment designed to figure out exactly how placebos work. Dr. Wager's theory is that the power of suggestion actually produces a physical change in the brain. And that is why placebos are able to mimic the effects of real medicines or make people feel drunk on fake beer. Some of the most convincing placebo effects have been demonstrated in people's reported pain. So that's a natural place to start looking for the effects of expectations and beliefs on physiological systems. Pain can be precisely quantified. We can uh, very carefully titrate the, the input, the stimulation levels, and we can observe meaningful and reliable relationships with the outcome. So it gives us something very quantitative to study. Professor Wager's plan was to study the region of the brain that senses pain. If a placebo did affect the workings of the brain, he thought the pain centers would be the ideal place to document any changes. This is the frontal cortex up here. And here, these are some of the key pain processing regions in the sensory cortex. A magnetic scanner would record the inner workings of Kate's brain in pain. You can just lie back here and get comfortable. The more intense the pain, the more brain activity would be recorded. Professor Wager turned up the pain while the scanner recorded images of Kate's brain. Okay, Kate, you're done with the first part. But that is not the end of Kate's ordeal. Professor Wager is planning on another burning session, but this time he's mercifully applying a painkiller. At least that's what Kate thinks is happening. In fact, it's a placebo, just plain baby lotion with no analgesic properties at all. We tell them that the drug that they're going to get is a powerful pain reliever, and it will block their pain. So it's really our verbal instructions to you that tell you that you should expect pain relief on this site that's been treated with this effective drug. Professor Wager burns Kate at the exact same searing temperature as before, and there is nothing protecting her forearm other than a dab of baby lotion. Yet according to the brain scans, there is considerably less brain activity in the pain centers now than before. That means Kate actually felt less pain, a lot less. One of the surprising things is that we found decreases in some of the pain processing regions of the brain with the placebo. Okay, now we're ready for the next one. What this means is the brain's ability to recognize pain actually is a strong yet flexible force that can physically respond to a placebo by changing the way the neurons fire. Next, you can turn into an Olympian by simply thinking about going to the gym. 
okay, not really. But your imagination can bring this closer than you'd ever imagine. All in Weird Connection 3. The power of suggestion. So strong in the last two connections that it could make people drunk without liquor and lessen the pain of a hot plate on a volunteer's arm. Is there a way to harness this force and trick your mind into some amazing things? Could you become an Olympic athlete by thinking about push-ups? Well, no. But you'd be surprised what your own brain is capable of. I think the mind can, can massively affect physical performance, especially when you get to the elite level. There's, there's very little difference physically between the athletes, and quite often it's then that they need the mental edge over the other athletes um, to, to come first and, and to win that gold medal. Dr. Caroline Wright and her colleague Dave Smith are sports psychologists with a strong workout ethic. Yet they may seem like heretics to the other gym regulars at the University of Chester in England. One of the things that we know is that, for example, if you imagine performing a sports skill or exercising or anything of that sort, the same areas of the brain start being activated whether you do something or whether you imagine doing it. We can use imagery, we can use a person's imagination to give them a mental workout, if you will, and that results in a lot of the same physical changes as actual training would do. Imagery is not really your imagination. Your brain actually responds with concrete changes. A lot of people think purely in terms of exercising the muscle, but just as important are the signals that are sent from the brain down to the muscles to tell them to contract. And we believe that using imagery can enhance your brain's ability to do this so you can recruit more muscle fibers and actually train harder and become stronger just through using your mind. It comes down to the neurons regulating all brain movement. Think about lifting a particular weight, and the neurons will fire to some extent, even if you don't move at all. Exactly how much could a brain be fooled into developing muscles without physical exertion? The researchers recruited novice weightlifters and got them to perform a classic strength test, the bicep curl. The participants came into the study and they, they went on the bicep machine to see how strong that they were. And then one group sat at the machine and imaged completing um, a set of physical practice. Another group actually phys physically practiced the task. The workout for the control group was standard fare. Well, I'm right to the top. And you're doing really good. Keep going, keep going. A few more. But the imagery group had a gym experience like no other. Okay, so if you just hold on to the handles, you're just going to complete the imagery in the way we discussed, pay, paying particular attention to the feel of the movement. They sat at the machine watching a video of themselves completing um, the rep that was taken in the, in the pre-test, and then they just tried to vividly image or imagine themselves completing the task. Meanwhile, the control group subjects were still hard at it, wondering how they'd ended up with the raw deal. Six weeks later, everyone was asked to repeat the bicep curl strength test. It's really nice and slow, two up, two down. The results? They simply flew in the face of common sense. Those in the group that lifted weights twice a week had increased their strength by 26%. But the athletes who spent half their time just thinking about exercise showed a 28% increase. Incredible. Through mental exercise, these athletes had not only kept up with the control group, they had surpassed it. Well, my eureka moment was when I did my results section and I plotted it all onto the graph and then I could see that the largest percentage improvement was, was by a group that was, was physically, physically practicing less than the physical practice group. So they'd actually replaced half of the physical practice with imagery and they were performing better. I was very shocked when that happened because um, most athletes, if you ask them to replace half of their physical training with imagery, would laugh at you. Here is how it works. The journey of nerve impulses can be set in motion by focused thought about the process of an exercise. It starts in the motor cortex of the brain. As you imagine your workout, 
electrical impulses travel down the spinal cord into the muscles. They command them to flex and extend, just as if they were under physical exertion. When athletes lift weights, they aren't just exercising their muscles. They're pounding down a well-worn path from the brain to the muscles through this nerve network. I like to think of training neural pathways as walking across a field of long grass. And the first time you walk across it, it's very difficult to find your way. But the more and more that you do it, the easier it becomes and the less likely you are to deviate off that path. But don't give up physical exercise in favor of only thinking about it just yet. Imagery is a really powerful tool, and it can certainly help you in your quest to gain fitness, but on its own, it's not going to be an adequate substitute. If you can't train because you're injured or something like that, or you're ill, then imagery can be an effective substitute. But the best thing to do is both imagery and physical training as well. Our next connection is about as weird as they come. Imagine being able to look inside your own brain and control what's going on. For the first time now, it's possible to image the processes of the brain in real time, live action, as people think and feel and experience sensations such as pain. It's a fascinating new concept in brain scanning, developed by neurobiologist Christopher de Charms. A breakthrough that came from his work with chronic pain patients at the University of California, San Francisco. Chronic pain is one of the most devastating conditions that a person can experience. It can wreck a person's life entirely. In the United States, it leads to about $100 billion in annual health care costs. His live-action brain scan could potentially be just the thing pain patients urgently need. We're working on technology to allow people to look inside their brain in real time, watch its activities as they take place, and try to learn how to control them. The key to the technique is actually harnessing the power of the placebo. So the placebo effect is normally thought of as an unconscious process, one that someone isn't aware is happening to them. But it's possible that using this approach, we may be able to teach someone to take conscious control over those same systems, teach someone to deliberately produce a placebo effect, and thereby bring their pain down at will. Dave, a long-term pain patient, needed an alternative to addictive and often ineffective medication. Whenever he saw this symbol of a campfire, he was instructed to think about putting the fire out or making the flame smaller. The fire sign corresponded with the amount of pain activity going on in his brain. The brain has systems built within it, very powerful ones, for down-regulating pain when the need arises. We hope that we can train people to control these systems and thereby be able to gain control over their pain. Sounds fascinating, but will it work? It was time for Dave to be scanned and have his brain activity monitored as he was watching the pain imagery of the campfire through virtual reality goggles. All right, so you're going to decrease your brain activation during this period. So Dave's now trying to decrease the fire. As you can see now, the fire is all the way out. The graph is going way down. He's been able to bring the brain activation quite a bit lower. Watch the pain indicators closely. See how the pain chart decreases as the flame graphic is snuffed out? Dave has learned to control the placebo effect in his own brain's pain processing center without drugs or other therapy. And as he works at this skill, his mind can become ever more powerful. As they get better and better, they're increasing the strength and increasing their control over this brain system. Reducing a patient's searing discomfort by the force of suggestion just might change the entire field of pain management over the next decade. We hope that we can learn to have a greater degree of control over many aspects of our own conscious life and also potentially over disease conditions. Call it mind control or call it placebo power, but the day is rapidly approaching when the suggestive nature of the human brain will be tapped as a mainstream technique for improved job performance. If we can control pain, we can control stress. 
That's the final stage of our journey, already being considered by workers in one high-stress job that has no room for error. As an air traffic controller, we can't make mistakes. We're dealing with lives. If I make a mistake, I could kill someone. You can't forget it. Nobody lets you forget it. It's unforgiving. Uh, it's very stressful. Dan Olson is assigned to the very busy air traffic hub above Seattle, Washington. He is personally responsible for the safety of thousands of air travelers. We work 60 airplanes in an hour. You're talking to maybe 2,000 people on those airplanes. No wonder tension is part of the skyscape for air traffic controllers. 35 Rogers, fly heading up 040. It's also a factor that can rattle the concentration mandatory for the job. Air traffic control is about three things focus, concentration, keeping a cool head. The weird connections that started out with something as far fetched as students getting drunk on fake beer now have implications as far reaching as our skies because the power of the placebo may one day be used as on-the-job training for air traffic controllers. If technology came along that would help us increase our focus and reduce our stress levels, it would revolutionize air traffic control as we know it. With 87,000 airplanes soaring over America each day, the practical use of placebo power is as clear and limitless as a cloudless blue sky. In these five weird connections, scientists have only begun to tap into this incredible force inside the human brain. And it's there for the taking in each of us. Search your heart for what ails you, and one day, with focus and training, your own brain just might be your primary physician.